As a little child needs constant care and protection, so does Upper Mahamsa, an illumined soul, who frequently goes in and out of Samadhi. In this God-intoxicated state, the Paramahamsa is completely oblivious of his body and surroundings. As a result, he is subject to the risk of accidental injury. The Paramahamsa's body is extremely precious because it is God's instrument to benefit humanity. That is why it is the disciples' duty to protect their Guru's body. On 20th June 1884, Sri Ramakrishna said to M, the recorder of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, You see, I am having some difficulty about my physical needs. It will be nice if Baburam lives with me. The nature of these attendants of mine is undergoing a change. Latu is always tense with spiritual emotion. He is about to merge himself in God. Rakhal is getting into such a spiritual mood that he can't do anything even for himself. I have to get water for him. He isn't of much service to me. Moreover, Rakhal had to visit home occasionally. Although several devotees lived with the Master, he could only bear the touch of certain people during his ecstasy. On 30th June he told Baburam, Do stay with me. It will be very nice. In this mood I cannot allow others to touch me, to Matangini. Baburam's mother was a devotee of the Master. When she visited Dakshineswar during this time, the Master asked her, Will you give me something? Yes, sir, whatever you ask. Will you give me your son? I want a pure-hearted boy to live here. I am greatly pleased even when he gives me a glass of water. Matangini at once agreed, It is my good fortune, sir, that you will accept him and that he will live with you. But does anybody give away her son for nothing? Ramakrishna smiled and asked, What shall I give you? Matangini humbly said, I have just two requests. One is that I may have unflinching devotion for God, the other is that none of my children dies before I do. Sri Ramakrishna granted her those boons. Three Baburam Ghosh was born at 11.55 p.m. on Tuesday, 10th December 1861, at Antpur, a village 30 miles from Calcutta. His father, Taraprasanna Ghosh, and mother, Matangini Devi, came from two well-to-do and aristocratic families of the same village. Both were pious and devoted to their family deity, Lakshmi Narayan. They had one daughter, Krishnavvini, who was married to Balaram Basu, a devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, and three sons, Tulsiram, Baburam, and Shantiram. Through Balaram, his family and his wife's family became devotees of the Master. Very little is known about Baburam's early life. He was an extremely handsome child with a fair complexion. It is said that even as a little boy of four or five he could not bear the idea of marriage. If he were teased about it, he would vehemently protest, waving his hands, Don't say that. Oh, don't make me marry. I would die, for when he was eight, Baburam would imagine a beautiful wooded place on the bank of the Ganges where he would live in a hut with another monk and meditate on God. These holy wishes were fulfilled when Baburam came in contact with Sri Ramakrishna in Dakshineswar. Baburam studied for a few years in his village school, then his mother sent him to his uncle in North Calcutta to continue his education. He was first admitted to Banga Vidyalaya, then to Aryan School, and finally to Metropolitan School, Shambhajar, where M was the headmaster and Rakhal was his classmate. Later, Baburam reminisced about his early life. My mother now and then would shut herself up in a room and meditate all day. If we happened to return home from Calcutta on those days, we had to live in a neighboring house and meet her the next day. She was very strict in her discipline. She would never allow us to stay with her in the village home, lest that spoil our education. 
but she would never utter a harsh word to her daughters in law or even to servants i was very naughty as a young boy so i have got some scars on my forehead swami ji used to say he is no boy who has no scars on his head dot five first meetings with shri ramakrishna in pascal's immortal words you would not have looked for me if you had not found me from his very childhood baburam knew his goal he was looking for a guru who could help him to reach it one day he went to hari sabha at josanko to listen to discourses on the bhagavata and there he saw shri ramakrishna without knowing who he was however some time before matangini and tulsiram had visited the master at dakshineswar observing baburam's religious inclination tulsiram told him to visit the master who like shri goranga lost all consciousness of the world while uttering the name of god baburam had learned that rakhal often visited the master the next dav in school he asked rakhal more about the saint of dakshineswar thief planned to visit him the next saturday after school hours probably on 8th april 1882 baburam reminisced about that memorable visit swami brahmananda and i went to hathkola ghat in west calcutta to take a boat for dakshineswar and there we met ramdayal babu learning that he was also going to see shri ramakrishna we got in a boat together it was almost dusk when we reached rani ras mani's kali temple we went to the master's room and were told that he had gone to the temple to pay obeisances to the mother of the universe asking us to stay there swami brahmananda went towards the mother's temple to find the master Soon I saw him holding on to the master very carefully and guiding him saying steps go up here down here I had already heard that the master would often become overwhelmed with ecstasy and lose outer consciousness therefore I knew that he was in an ecstatic mood when I saw him coming reeling like a drunken man he entered the room in that state and sat on a small bedstead Shortly afterwards he came back to normal consciousness. Dot 6 when Ramakrishna inquired about the newcomer Ramdayal introduced him. Ramakrishna said, "Ah, you are a relative of Balaram. Then you are related to us also. Well, what is your native place?" "Antpur, sir. Ah, then I must have visited it." Kalu and Gulu of Jampukur also belong to that place, don't they? Yes, sir. But how do you know them? Why, they are sons of Ram Prasad Mitra. When I was at Jampukur, I used to go frequently to their house as well as to that of the Gambar Mitra. Seven saying this, the master caught hold of Baburam's hand and said, "Come closer to the light. Let me see your face." In the dim light of an earthen lamp he thoroughly examined Baburam's face hands and feet and he expressed great satisfaction then he weighed Baburam's forearm by plar mg it on his palm it was one of his ways of judging a person's spur if it was lighter than ordinary he would say that this showed a beneficent intelligence observing the auspicious signs The master expressed with joy, "Very good, very good." Baburam recalled his first night at Dakshineswar. A few hours were spent delightfully in religious talk. We took our supper at 10 p.m. and lay down on the southeast veranda of the master's room. Beds were arranged for the master and Swami Brahmananda in the room. but scarcely had an hour passed when the master came out of his room with his cloth under one arm and came to our bedside addressing ramdayal babu he asked affectionately are you sleeping both of us quickly sat up in our beds and replied no sir the master said look i have not seen narendra for a long time and i feel as if my whole soul were being forcibly wrung like a wet towel please ask him to come once and see me he is a person of pure sattva qualities he is narayana himself 
I cannot have peace of mind if I don't see him now and then. Ramdeyal Babu had been visiting Dakshineswar for some time, so the childlike nature of the master was not unknown to him. Seeing that childlike behavior, he knew that the master was in ecstasy. He tried to console the master by promising that he would see Narendra first thing in the morning and ask him to come and similar other things. But the master's mood was not at all alleviated that night. Knowing that we were getting no rest, he would return to his room now and then for some time. But after a while he would forget and again come back to us and begin speaking of Narendra's good qualities, expressing pathetically the terrible anguish of his mind on account of Narendra's long absence. Eight in the morning Baburam found the master quite normal and there was no trace of anxiety on his face. He was overwhelmed observing the master's love for Narendra and he thought Narendra must be a very hard-hearted person. The master asked Baburam to walk around the Panchavati grove where he had practiced sadhana. Baburam was astonished to find that it was exactly like the wooded place on the Ganges that he had envisioned in his boyhood. Then the master sent Baburam to visit the deities in the temples, which he did. When he took leave of the master, the latter affectionately said, Come again. Three days after the first visit, Ramdayal met Baburam at Bagbazar and informed him that the master had asked for him. Baburam was moved by the master's kindness. On the following Sunday, he arrived at Dakshineswar at 8 a.m. When he saw Baburam, the master said, It is nice that you have come. Go to the Panchavati, where they are having a picnic. Carry this firewood there. Narendra has come. Have a talk with him. 9. At the Panchavati, Baburam found Rakhal, who introduced him to Narendra and some other young devotees of the master. They were having great fun. Baburam had heard about Narendra's greatness beforehand and now he was impressed by Narendra's large, expressive eyes and handsome, vigorous form. His friendly jokes and humor, fiery conversation and heavenly sea and gang captivated Baburam's mind. He quickly realized that Narendra was a brilliant man who excelled in everything. One afternoon Baburam came to visit the master at Dakshineswar. As soon as he arrived, the master said to him, Baburam, it is good that you have come. This gentleman, pointing to Devan Majumdar, has come from Calcutta and now is suffering from a high fever. He can't return by himself, so take him immediately to his home by boat. I have so many things to tell you. Please come another day. Baburam took the dust of the master's feet and left for Calcutta with Devin.10 Love is reciprocal. As the disciples loved the Master, he also loved them dearly. Later, Baburam reminisced, the Master used to cry whenever I left Dakshineswar to return to Calcutta. Oh, how can I explain to you how much he loved us? He would go to Calcutta in a carriage just so he could feed Purna, a young devotee. He would wait near the school where Puna went, send someone to bring the boy and then feed him delicacies. One day he was found waiting outside Balaram Babu's house where I was staying. Balaram Babu was not at home and the master was hesitant to go inside, thinking he might not be welcomed. He had come to see me. Someone finally called him in. His love knew no bounds and one drop of it completely filled us. Each one thus thought himself to be the most beloved of the Master. 11. Baburam was 20 when he first met the Master, though he appeared to be much younger. He was very handsome, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, and rather slim. He had black hair and a complexion like pure gold. In the beginning he visited the Master only on holidays, so that his family would not think that he was neglecting his studies. On 20th June 1884, the master asked M. Tell me, 
Does Baburam intend to continue with his studies? I said to him, Continue your studies to set an example to others. I don't want Baburam to tear himself away from his family. It may make trouble at home. Twelve during these first visits, Ramakrishna recognized through his yogic vision that Baburam had been born as a part of Radha, the spiritual consort of Krishna. On 20th June 1884, the master said to M. Dot, I noticed the other day that Baburam has a feminine nature. In a vision, I saw Baburam as a goddess with a necklace around her neck and with women companions times 185 about her. He has received something in a dream. His body is pure. Only a very little effort will awaken his spiritual consciousness. 13. On other occasion he described Baburam as a Nityasiddha, ever-perfect soul, and an Ishwar Koti, godlike soul. The master earmarked six of his disciples as Ishwar Kotis. Narendra, Rakhal, Baburam, Yogin, Niranjan, and Puma. On 30th June 1884, the master again said to M. Dot, Yesterday, I came to know Baburam's inner nature. That is why I have been trying so hard to persuade him to live with me. The mother bird hatches the egg in proper time. Boys like Baburam are pure in heart. They have not yet fallen into the clutches of woman and gold. They are like a new pot. Milk kept in it will not turn sour. I need Baburam here. I pass through certain spiritual states when I need someone like him. 14. About Baburam's purity, the master used to say, He is pure, pure to the very marrow of his bones. 15. In the company of the master, Baburam was deemed a proper attendant for Sri Ramakrishna because of his absolute purity. He was one of those fortunate souls whose touch the master could bear during Samadhi, and many were the occasion when he was found supporting the master in that state lest he should fall and be injured. Later, Baburam reminisced, Sri Ramakrishna was the embodiment of purity. A man earned a lot of money by taking bribes. One day this person touched the master's feet while he was in Samadhi, and he cried out in pain. During the master's samadhi we had to hold him so he would not fall, but we were afraid. We thought that if we were not pure enough, then, when we touched him during samadhi, he would publicly cry out in pain. So we prayed for purity. It was the master's grace that I was allowed to live with him. 16. On 21st September 1884, Ramakrishna went to the Star Theatre to see the play Chaitanya Leela, the divine play of Sri Chaitanya. Baburam recalled, Before we left Dakshineswar, he said to me, Look, if I go into Samadhi there, people will turn towards me and there will be a commotion. If you see me on the verge of Samadhi, Talk to me about various other things. But when he went to the theatre, he could not stop going into Samadhi, even though he tried. I began to repeat the name of God, and slowly he came round. Such experiences of Bhava, Ecstasy, Mahabhava, Great Ecstasy, and Samadhi were natural with him. He had to struggle hard in order to hold his mind down to the normal plane. 17. Sometime in 1884, Baburam begged the master for Samadhi. Ramakrishna consoled him, saying, All right, I shall ask the Divine Mother 186 times God lived with them about it. Does anything happen by my will, my child? But Baburam insisted on Samadhi. He then had to return to Antpur on business. In the meantime, the master expressed his concern to others. You see, Baburam wept much and asked for Samadhi before he left. What will happen? If he does not have it, he will have no regard for the words of this place, meaning himself. Dot. He then prayed to the mother, Please grant, mother, that Baburam may have a little ecstasy or other spiritual experience. The mother replied, He will not have ecstasy, he will have knowledge. 
This relieved the master to some extent. In 1885, Baburam was preparing for his entrance examination, but after meeting the master, he cared very little for study. On 7th March 1885, Ramakrishna said to Baburam, Where are your books? Aren't you attending to your studies? To him. He wants to stick to both, God and the world. That is very difficult. What will you gain by knowing God partially? One procures the thorn of knowledge to remove the thorn of ignorance, then one goes beyond both knowledge and ignorance. That's what I want, said Baburam. But, my child, said the Master, can you attain it by holding to both? If you want that, then come away. Baburam said joyfully, Take me away from the world. 18 Baburam failed his entrance examination. A few days later he came to Dakshineswar with Vakuntanath Sanyal. Baburam was very much afraid of what the master would say. When Vakuntha told Baburam's bad news to the master, he made light of it. Well, he said, that is very good. You have failed to pass, now you are free from all passes. In Bengali, Pass is the same word as fetter. With Baburam's formal education at an end, his spiritual education began under the Master's guidance. He received his mother's approval and began living at Dakshineswar permanently. On 7th March 1885, the Master said to him, In front of Baburam, I have been seeking one who has totally renounced woman and gold. When I find a young man, I think that perhaps he will live with me, but everyone raises some objection or other. 19. Baburam had no objection, so the master called him Dardi, the companion of his soul. Living with Ramakrishna was a great education. He taught his disciples through his life, not merely with words. Baburam watched the master day and night and imbibed the spirit of renunciation and purity, which are the two main pillars of spiritual life. Later, Baburam recalled, One night I was sleeping in the master's room. In the dead of night I woke up and found him pacing from one end of his room to the other, saying, Mother, I do not want this. Do not bring me honor from men. Don't, mother, don't. I spit on it. Saying this, he paced back and forth like a madman. I was filled with wonder. I thought, how strange. People are so eager for name and fame, and he is pleading with the mother not to give it to him. Why is this happening before me? Is it to instruct me? The master could not bear any kind of bondage. If the edge of his mosquito curtain was tucked under the mattress, he would feel suffocated. It was instead dropped around the edge of his bed. He could not even button his shirt. We had to do that for him. And neither could he bolt his door. He saw God in everything. One day someone tore a piece of new cloth in front of him and he cried out, Oh, pain! Once I saw a person secretly put money under the master's mattress when he was not in his room. Later when the master came back, he could not go near the bed. His renunciation was phenomenal. Can an ordinary person conceive of such things? We have seen his ideal life, so we speak with conviction. Sometimes the master would entertain us by imitating a dancing girl, placing one hand on his waist and moving his other hand about. Again, through humor, tales and parables, he would explain to us the most intricate philosophies which were confusing even to scholars. His wonderful skill in teaching left a deep impression on our hearts forever. The master was adept in explaining the supreme spiritual truths in simple, sweet language. Never see faults in others. Rather see your own faults, said the master. Once, in front of the master, some visitors were criticizing the character of Satish Giri, the abbot of the Tarkeshwar monastery. Immediately Sri Ramakrishna diverted their attention to the abbot's good qualities. 
The master did not like his devotees to gossip. We saw how lovingly the master used to receive the devotees at Dakshineswar. He would ask, Do you want to chew a bitel roll? If the devotee said, No, he would then ask, Would you like to smoke tobacco? Thus, in so many ways he would take care of the devotees. The master showered his grace on Girish Chandra Ghosh and even on many prostitutes. One day the ladies of Balaram Babu's family were sitting before the master in his room when a prostitute named Ramani passed along the road nearby. The master called to her and asked, Why don't you come nowadays? The ladies were scandalized to hear the master talking with a prostitute. Shortly afterwards, the master took them to visit the shrines. When they reached the Kali temple, the master said to the mother, Mother, thou indeed hast become the prostitute and the chaste woman. The ladies understood that they were wrong in hating Ramani, that the master spoke with her, knowing her to be the mother herself, and that they should not be so proud of their chastity, for it was all due to the mother's will. Once the master assured a devotee, Have you committed a sin? Don't be afraid. Take a vow, I will not sin anymore. I shall swallow all of your sins. Twenty-one day Sri Ramakrishna was resting in his room at Dakshineswar. Baburam and some other young boys were with Hajra on the eastern porch of the master's room. Hajra said to Baburam and others, You are all mere boys. You are visiting Sri Ramakrishna off and on, and he just keeps you satisfied with fruits and sweets. Hold him, press him, and get something, power, wealth, and so on, from him. As soon as the master heard this from his room, he jumped up from his bed, rushed to the veranda, and shouted, Baburam, come to my room right now. Don't listen to his calculating advice. The beggar pesters the rich man, saying, Sir, give me a pice. Give me a pice. Being disgusted with the beggar, the rich man throws a small coin to him, saying, Take this and get out of here. You are my very own. You will not have to ask for anything from me. Whatever I have, it is all yours. 21. As the mother bird protects her fledglings, so the master guarded his young disciples from various evil influences. One day at Dakshineswar, the master said to Baburam, I can't touch you today. Did you do anything wrong? No, sir. Then why can't I touch you? After a while, Baburam remembered that in the morning while chatting with his friend, he had said something which was not true. He confessed it to the master. Baburam realized that Sri Ramakrishna's life was established in truth, and that truthfulness is the key to God realization. 22 Baburam used to give personal service to the master, such as sweeping the floor, making his bed, and preparing tobacco and bitter rolls. He used to rub the master's body with oil before his bath, and would fan him when necessary. Baburam would accompany Ramakrishna whenever he visited the devotees' houses or theatres in Calcutta. One day at Balaram's house in Calcutta, Baburam was pouring water for the master to wash his hands. Downstairs a few schoolgirls were playing. The master watched a girl swirling a bunch of keys tied in. The corner of her sari cloth. Pointing to that girl, the master said to Baburam, Look, Girls tie boys like that bunch of keys and spin them around. Likewise do you want to move around in their hands? 23. Baburam realized that the master was instructing him to be free from the temptation of women. Bhartrihri said in his Varagishatkam, 100 verses on renunciation everything is fraught with fear in this world, renunciation alone makes one fearless. Sri Ramakrishna advised, his young monastic disciples to renounce both externally and internally, he advised his householder disciples to renounce internally. Many years later Baburam related how the master taught the monastic disciples, very little of the master's teachings is recorded in the gospel.
N used to visit the master occasionally and would note down his teachings as he heard them. His teachings to the monastic disciples were given in private. As soon as the householder devotees would leave the room, he would get up and lock the door and then speak to us living words of renunciation. He would try to impress upon our young minds the emptiness and vanity of worldly enjoyments. 24. The Master kept a watchful eye over his would-be monastic disciples. He gave them spiritual instructions and would send them at night to different areas in the temple garden to practice meditation. He generally kept Baburam and Rakhal near him. He even told the Holy Mother how many pieces of chapati, unleavened bread, should be given to each disciple. Baburam was supposed to have four, but Holy Mother gave him six. When the Master came to know about it, he immediately went to the Nahabat and complained that her indiscreet affection might ruin Baburam's future life. The Holy Mother firmly replied, why are you so much worried because he had a couple more chapati? I shall look after his future. Please don't make an issue about his food. The Master understood that Holy Mother's action was justified as she exercised her motherly prerogative towards her children. Every action and word of Sri Ramakrishna's was meaningful. He was a very light eater but would eat his meal consisting of various dishes. One day he said to Baburam and others, Do you know why I eat my meal with all these items? If I ate all the items mixed together, which would lead him to the experience of oneness, my mind would merge into the infinite and never return. For you people I keep my mind on a lower plane by creating desires, such as, I shall eat my rice with five kinds of curries, and so on. The master kept some small, harmless desires, so that he could function in the world and help his devotees. Baburam later recalled about his spiritual training, the master encouraged us to read the scriptures and holy books. He kept some books such as Mukti o Teher Sadhan, Liberation and its Practice, in his room and sometimes asked us to read them to him. When a person reads about God, his mind is absorbed in him. We saw him working in the garden and also sweeping his room. He could not tolerate work done in a slipshod manner. He himself did everything precisely and gracefully and he taught us to do the same. He would scold us if we did not put tools and other things back in their proper places. 25. In the middle of 1885, Ramakrishna developed throat cancer, moved to Calcutta for treatment, and finally settled in Kosipore. Baburam stayed with the Master and served him along with other disciples. Ramakrishna continued to train his disciples, and one day distributed twelve pieces of ochre cloth and twelve rosaries among them. Baburam was blessed by the Master with an ochre cloth and a rosary. The Master tied his disciples with a cord of love. Sometimes they would share their sweet memories with each other. Many years later, 15th August 1915, Baburam wrote to Swami Abhedananda who was then preaching Vedanta in America, Do you remember when you and I were together at the Kos Sipore Garden House? And the Master remarked, your relationship is between self and self. Do you remember what else he said? He said, You are like monkeys, and I am the monkey trainer holding in my hand the ropes tied around your waists. The monkey trainer pulls the rope if the monkeys become too troublesome. Please bear in your mind, brother, that we are monkeys in his hand, 26 in spite of his fatal illness, the master would make fun and tell jokes with his disciples. Holy Mother recalled, While living in the Kos Sipore garden, I was once climbing the steps, carrying a ball with five pounds of milk. I felt giddy and the milk spilt on the ground. My ankles were badly sprained. Narun and Baburam ran there and took care of me. There was a great inflammation of the feet. 
The master heard of the accident and said to Baburam, Well, Baburam, it is a nice mess I am in now. Who will cook my food? Who will feed me now? He was then ill with cancer of the throat and lived only on farina pudding. I used to make it and feed him in his room in the upper story of the house. I had then a ring in my nose. The master touched his nose and made a sign of the ring by making a circle with his finger in order to indicate me. He then said, Baburam, can you put her, making the sign, in a basket and carry her on your shoulder to this room? Naran and Baburam were convulsed with side-splitting laughter. Thus he used to cut jokes with them. After three days the swelling subsided. Then they helped me to go upstairs with his meals. 27 Baburam learned how his compassionate Guru served mankind and he later followed Ramakrishna's example in his own life. Years later he recalled, when he was suffering from the excruciating pain of cancer, every day he would wait for seekers of God to come. Sometimes he would look out at the street and say, What has happened? Nobody has come today. He could not talk but only whisper. He was hungry but could not eat. He found no relief either in sitting or in lying down. Day and night he felt a burning sensation all over his body. In spite of all this terrible suffering, he never stopped showering his grace on people and helping them realize God. This went on for a year and a half. If this is not crucifixion, I don't know what it is. 28 The disciples were desperate to save their master's life. They knew that Sri Ramakrishna had the power to heal himself, but he was reluctant to bring his mind from God to his body. One day the master had a hard time swallowing anything. Then he said, I shall eat later on in my subtle body through a million mouths. Baburam responded, I do not care for your million mouths or your subtle body. What I want is that you should eat through this mouth and that I should see this gross body. 29 Ramakrishna could not ordinarily eat any food if it was touched by an impure person or cooked by a non-Brahmin. He observed his Brahminical caste rules as he came to fulfill and not to destroy. Baburam recalled, One day the master asked me, Baburam was a non-Brahmin, to cook food for him and he ate from my hand. He was so gracious to me. A day or two before his passing away he asked all of us to feed him pudding and thus he withdrew all his restrictions. Thirty days of wandering and austerity Sri Ramakrishna passed away on 16th August 1886. Baburam temporarily moved to his mother's Calcutta residence. Shortly thereafter, the disciples established the first Ramakrishna monastery at Barnagore with the help of Surendra Mitra, a lay disciple of the Master. Baburam joined the group. In the middle of December 1886, Baburam's mother invited the master's disciples to her country home in Antpur. Narendra, Baburam, Sharat, Shashi, Tarak, Kali, Niranjan, Gangadhar and Sarada travelled to Antpur by train, singing devotional songs along the way. One cold night, a bonfire was lit in the courtyard. The disciples gathered around it and meditated for a long while. Then Narin began to tell them the story of Jesus, placing emphasis on His great renunciation. Greatly inspired, the disciples took the vow of renunciation in front of the dhuni fire. Later, they discovered that this evening had been Christmas Eve and they felt that a more propitious time for their vow could not have been chosen. After returning to Barnagore, the disciples took formal san nyasa, performing virajahoma, a special fire ceremony, in late January 1887. Narendra gave Baburam the name Premananda, meaning bliss of divine love, remembering the Master's remark that Sri Radha herself, the goddess of love, was partially incarnated in him. At Barnagore the disciples lived a very austere life. 
They had difficulty meeting their bare necessities. If they had rice to cook, they had no money to buy salt. However, it was of no concern to them whether they ate or slept. They spent hours in meditation and other spiritual practices. They were seized by a desire to merge themselves in God. Ramakrishnananda was the caretaker of the monastery and he took it upon himself to look after the monks and see that they ate at least one meal a day. Premananda would help with the household work as well as the master's worship. One day he fell from a tree while picking flowers and fractured his right wrist. He forgot his pain by thinking of the master. Later, Premananda told a touching episode about Swamiji. After the master's passing away, Swamiji used to cry for him so much secretly at night that his pillow would get wet and I would put it in the sun in the morning to dry. 31. We know very little of Premananda's life at the Barnagore Monastery, nor do we find a detailed account of his wanderings during this time. In the last part of February 1887, after Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary, Premananda left for Puri with Sardananda and Abhidananda. They stayed six months at Amar Monastery and attended the chariot festival of Jagannath. They lived on Prasad from the temple and would pass their days in meditation and japam. During his stay in Puri, Premananda had typhoid fever, but he soon recovered through the loving care of his brother disciples. Towards the end of August they left Puri and after visiting Bhuvneshwar, Konark, Udyagiri and Khandagiri, they returned to Barnagore. Sometime in 1889 Premananda went to Varanasi, where he met the great illumined soul Trilanga Swami and the learned ascetic Swami Bhaskarananda. In 1890 he went to Gazipur to see Vivekananda, who was then staying with the great Yogi Pavhari Baba. Premananda became ill there and was sent back to Varanasi to live with Abhedananda. On 13th April 1890, Premananda's brother-in-law, Balaram Basu, died. Upon hearing this sad news, the Swami returned to Calcutta to console his sister. The Ramakrishna Monastery was in Barnagore from 1886 to 1892 and in Alambazar, near Dakshineswar, from 1892 to 1897. While living in Alambajar, Premananda went to Dakshineswar quite often. He would practice japam and meditation for long hours either in the Panchavati or in the master's room. For getting food and rest, he lived on the memory of the master. He was extremely simple, humble and self-effacing. Although the monastery was their permanent home, from time to time the disciples would travel to various holy places in India for pilgrimage and to practice spiritual disciplines. Recalling the olden days in Alambazar Monastery, Turiyananda wrote to Premananda on 20th November 1915, The memory of all past associations with you gives me great joy. And why shouldn't it be so? You are so full of the Master that there is no room within you for anything else. This reminds me of an incident that took place at the Alambazar Monastery. As you spoke that day, you invoked the memory of the Master in all visible things. At that time I observed in you the truth of this saying, Wherever the eyes fall, there the Lord manifests. You did not see anything that did not remind you of the Master. I don't know whether you remember it or not, but it is indelibly imprinted on my mind. That day I realized what it is to be merged in God. 32 In 1895 Premananda visited various holy places in northern India and at last settled at Kalbabu's Kunja, Balaram Basu's retreat in Vrindavan. He would spend the entire day absorbed in the contemplation of God and in the evening he would visit the deities in the temples. In December, 1895. Ramakrishnananda wrote two letters to Premananda describing vividly the Master's visit to Vrindavan, which he had heard from Hriday, the Master's nephew, who had accompanied him. These letters, 
See Ramakrishna as we saw him, 159-60, helped Premananda to visualize the Master's pilgrimage to Vrindavan. After some time, Brahmachari Kalikrishna, later, Swami Virjananda, joined him. During the swing festival of Krishna, they and Bhaktamal, a Vaishnav monk, decided to circumambulate Vrindavan, a long tedious journey that takes many days. Bhaktamal asked Premananda to put on a pair of shoes, but the latter refused as it would be disrespectful to the holy place. Living on arms, they stayed in Barsana, the birthplace of Radha, for a month and a half. At last they returned to Vrindavan. Shortly thereafter Kalikrishna became ill, Premananda took him to Itava for treatment. They stayed with Hariprasanna, later, Swami Vijnanananda, who was working there as an engineer. In Itava they heard the news that Vivekananda was returning to India from the West. Towards the end of 1896 they left for Calcutta, but on the way they stopped at Burdwan to visit Holy Mother at Jairambati. They stayed there for a couple of weeks. One day during his walk, Premananda saw beautiful lotuses in a pond and his devotion for the Mother 13 swelled in his heart. Kalikrishna did not know how to swim, so Premananda got into the water and picked some lotuses to offer to Holy Mother. When he came out of the water, Kalikrishna noticed that nearly twenty leeches were stuck on his body. As soon as they were removed, Premananda began to bleed. Holy Mother was very worried and cautioned him not to do such a thing again. From Jairambati they went to Antpur via Tarkeshwar. At last they arrived at Alambazar Monastery, where they learned that Swamiji had reached Calcutta four or five days earlier. After returning from the West, Vivekananda introduced a daily routine in Alambazar Monastery in the morning meditation, chanting, exercise, karma yoga, in the afternoon, scripture class, question and answer sessions, vespers, meditation. If a monk did not get up early in the morning, he had to beg for his food that day. Once Premananda woke up late, he went to Swamiji and said, I am sorry I did not get up early today, brother, you made the rule that one should be punished for that reason. Please punish me. Immediately Swamiji gravely said, Baburam, could you imagine that I would punish you? Tears rolled from Swamiji's eyes. Brahmananda mediated the situation, saying, it is not a question of punishment. According to the rule, one is supposed to beg food that day, that's all, 33 Premananda left to beg for his food. In March 1897, Ramakrishnananda left for Madras to start a center and Premananda assumed the responsibility of the worship service. The Ramakrishna Monastery was moved from Alambazar to Nilambar Babu's garden house in Belur on 13th February 1898 and finally Swamiji consecrated the Belur Math on 9th December 1898. In the meantime, Premananda had left for a pilgrimage to northern India on 4th April 1898 and returned in December during the consecration ceremony. Premananda then resumed his worship service and Swamiji made him one of the trustees of Belur Math. One morning at 9 o'clock o'clock, Premananda was about to start worship in Belur Math's old shrine. Swamiji came to the shrine to bow down to the master. Seeing Premananda, Swamiji said, Brother, all these days you have been worshipping the Lord with flowers and sandal paste, now start worshipping the living gods. Go to Belur village and serve the poor ARD the afflicted. Then Swamiji asked his disciple Brahmachari Nandalal to perform the worship and Premananda left the shrine to obey his leader's order. In the village he found an old, sick widow and offered her Rietman from the monastery's charitable dispensary, but the woman refused his help. Then he came across a few unwashed children in a Notner area, he brought them to the monastery, cleaned them with soap Swami Premananda times 195 and water, fed them, 
and sent them back to their homes. When Premananda was asked, he told Swamiji about his experience, When I was serving them, I felt I was actually serving the Master through living gods. 34. Sri Ramakrishna made Vivekananda the leader of his disciples. It is really astounding how they obeyed and respected him. One day in Belur, Sharat Chandra Chakrabarti had a dream that he was worshipping his Guru, Vivekananda. He told Swamiji about his dream and begged for permission to worship him. Swamiji had to acquiesce. When the ceremony was over, Swamiji said to the disciple, Well, your worship is finished. Now Premananda will be in a rage at your sacrilegious act of worshipping my feet in the flower tray meant for Sri Ramakrishna's worship. Before his words were finished, Premananda entered the room. Swamiji said to him, Look, what a sacrilege he has committed. With the articles of the Master's worship, he has worshipped me. Premananda said with a smile, Well done. Are you and the Master different? 35 In the beginning, in order to train the novices, Swamiji made a rule that nobody should nap in the afternoon. One day Swamiji learned that Premananda was sleeping, perhaps he had not slept the previous night. But Swamiji ordered his disciple, Go drag him from the bed. Pull him out by the feet. The disciple obeyed his Guru. Premananda cried, What are you doing? Stop! Stop! He did not stop. Premananda understood that Swamiji was behind it, so he did not say anything. After Vespers, Swamiji was pacing in the northern veranda of his room. As soon as he saw Premananda, he embraced him and said, Brother, our master used to treasure you in his heart, and I am such a person that I asked that you be dragged from your bed. I am not fit to live here. 36 Then he began to sob uninterruptedly. Premananda had a hard time consoling Swamiji that day. There is a saying, only he who loves can rule. The brother disciples recognized the greatness of Swamiji who was completely free from selfishness or any personal motivation. He was a real leader. He did not compromise the ideal or dilute the truth. One afternoon Swamiji was holding a class for the junior monks, which continued till evening. Seeing nobody in the shrine for Vespers, Premananda went to the classroom and said to the young monks, What are you doing? Aren't you coming to Vespers? Finish the class and come. Swamiji immediately became angry with Premananda and said harshly, Is it your idea that what I am doing here is not worship? When you ring the bell in the shrine, is only that worship? He continued to berate Premananda. 196 times God lived, with them Premananda was crestfallen. He went away and finished the Vesper service by himself and then disappeared. All of the monks searched for him everywhere, but could not find him. Swamiji lamented his harshness towards Premananda. He went to the shrine of Sri Ramakrishna and struck his forehead again and again on the threshold, begging forgiveness for having spoken so rudely. It is said that he struck his forehead so many times and with such intensity that the skin broke and his forehead began to bleed. At last Premananda was discovered seated alone on the roof, very morose and melancholy. The monks brought him down to Swamiji and the latter embraced him and begged his forgiveness. Swami Vivekananda passed away on 4th July 1902. Three days earlier, while walking on the spacious lawn of the monastery with Premananda, Swamiji had pointed to a spot on the bank of the Ganges and said, when I give up the body, cremate it there. On the day that he died, Swamiji had breakfast and lunch with Premananda. He was in a jovial mood and gave classes to the monks. After 4 p.m., Swamiji walked with Premananda to Belur Bazar and back, a mile each way. 
Swamiji felt good and talked to his brother disciple on many interesting subjects. He also mentioned his plan for establishing a Vedic college in the monastery. In order to have a clearer understanding of what Swamiji felt on the matter, Premananda asked, What will be the good of studying the Vedas? Vivekananda replied, It will kill superstitions. 37. Manager of Belur Math before his passing away, Vivekananda gave two instructions to Premananda, first, to manage Belur Math, the headquarters of the Ramakrishna order, second, not to initiate anyone. If you make disciples, he said, then your disciples will quarrel and compete with Brahmanandas. Premananda obeyed Swamiji. Swami Brahmananda was the president of the Ramakrishna order, so he had to travel all over India to give initiation and to promote the cause of the organization. As a result, Premananda was practically in charge of Belur Math. Apart from his regular worship sendi, he trained the monks, entertained the devotees and visitors, supervised the kitchen, dairy and garden, took care of the sick monks, collected money for the maintenance of the monastery and sometimes went on lecture tours. His body was fragile, but his magnetic personality attracted many people to him. Sri Ramakrishna was living to him, and he had an ability to imprint that feeling in others. Premananda taught more through the example of his life than through his words. A monk recorded his daily routine, he would go to bed at 11 p.m. and get up at 3 o'clock or 3.30 a.m. After washing, he would go to the shrine and perform the morning service to the master and then he would meditate with the monks for a couple of hours. Then, if Swami Brahmananda was at Belur, all would go to his room and bow down to him and there would be devotional singing. At 8 a.m. Premananda would instruct the monks to do their respective duties. He himself would sit with some monks, cutting and cleaning vegetables for lunch. It was quite a job because a large meal, with various dishes, was prepared for many monks and devotees. Premananda taught the monks practical Vedanta, how to blend work and worship in daily life. Even while chopping vegetables, he would talk about the master and relate many stories. His watchful eyes were everywhere. If someone peeled a potato a little too deeply, the Swami would remind him that the vegetables had been bought with the devotees' hard-earned money and great sacrifice of their comfort. It was not proper for the monks to misuse those things. Premananda could not tolerate any waste and he imprinted this idea in the minds of newcomers. He also joined the monks in pulling out weeds from the courtyard, cutting fodder for the cows and making cow dung balls for fuel by mixing cow dung with coal dust. He did not just give orders. All work here is sacred, he would say, whether you cut vegetables, whether you prepare cow dung balls, whether you go out to give lectures or worship in the chapel, everything is sendy unto the Lord. You have to learn to do everything with an equal sense of reverence and sanctity in your heart. 38 True religion means the manifestation of perfection within. Premananda insisted on this perfection in even seven action. Swami Ashokananda recalled. He continually impressed upon the minds of the monks that they had to be completely devoid of ego, completely devoid of any kind of carelessness, completely devoid of any kind of worldly desire. Everything had to be done perfectly from beginning to end. Once he explained the reason for it, my boys, one day you will have to do very responsible things. If you don't learn the habit of responsibility in small things, you will not learn the habit of responsibility in big things. You will cheat, 39 after cutting vegetables, he would bathe in the Ganges and then he would go to the shrine to perform the ritualistic worship of Sri Ramakrishna. It was a simple but very intense worship with at least half an hour of meditation. It would end about 10.30 am 
Then he would cam seven the flower tray and offer flowers to the mother Ganges. Afterwards, he would take some prasad. If there were any devotees or guests, he would talk about the teachings of the master or he would go to supervise the vegetable garden and dairy. At 11.30 a.m., he would offer cooked food to the master and then eat his lunch. After a little rest, he would answer letters and then give a class to the monks. In the afternoon, he would go for a walk and in the evening he would perform the Vesper service and sit for meditation. Afterwards, Premananda would join the monks and devotees in the visitor's room, where there was either devotional singing or reading and discussion from Vivekananda's works, or he would reminisce about the Master. When the bell for food offering was rung, Premananda would go to the shrine to offer food to the Master and then close the shrine for the day. He would then eat supper. Before retiring he would attend to the needs of visiting devotees, making sure that they had beds to sleep in and that they were all comfortable and properly cared for. This was his daily life, Swami Rameshwarandari called. From early morning till he went to bed, Swami Premananda spent his whole time serving the master, the monks and the devotees. He was an embodiment of service. His service to the Master was living, as if he could see the Master rising from bed, washing his mouth, eating his meals, resting in his bed, and walking in the garden. He would instruct the monks, cut the overgrowth of the thorny rose plants, otherwise they will stick to the cloth of the Master. Watch so that he may not find difficulty walking in the monastery compound. Don't put too much lime in the betel roll, it will burn the tongue of the master. He preferred to eat warm food, don't serve cold food to him. When you make sandalpaste for worship, there should not be any rough particles in it. In Dakshineswar the master loved flowers and the sweet fragrance of incense, therefore decorate the master's shrine with flowers and burn incense. Putting the master to bed, Drop the mosquito curtain and mentally massage his feet. Keep a glass of water on a stool next to the master's bed. If by chance he gets up, he may drink it. Change the cloth on the master's picture on the altar every day. In 1916 to 171 used to perform worship in the shrine. One day Swami Premananda asked me, Is the clothing of the master okay? My boy, look carefully. After offering a new cloth to the master, I was about to put it on, then the master told me through a vision, Baburam, you are going to have a new cloth, and my shirt is torn. Don't you love me anymore? Then both of us went to the shrine and found that the master's shirt had been chewed by a mouse. Forty service to the devotees Premananda's life depicts how a person acts, behaves and lives in this world after God-realization. His heart swells with love and compassion for people's suffering and he acts without any ulterior motive or selfishness. Work turns into worship for him. The Hindu scriptures say, those who are devoted to God are not true devotees, but those who are devoted to the devotees of God are true devotees. Premananda taught the monks that service to the master and service to the devotees are not different. He quoted the saying of Sri Ramakrishna, Bhagavata Bhakta Bhagavan, the scripture, the devotee and God, all three are the same. Another time he said, the master called from the roof of the Kuthi, Bangalow, in Dakshineswar, O devotees, wherever you are, please come. Is that call only for a few of us? He called you and many more. All the devotees of the Master have not yet arrived. 41. When flowers bloom, bees come of their own accord. Premananda's love and magnetic personality attracted many people to Belur Math and sometimes they even came at odd times. College boys from Calcutta used to gather there. He always received them as a loving mother. 
He considered it a great privilege for the monks to serve devotees with food and hospitality, love and spirituality. Sometimes he gave his own food to the devotees and went without. Devotees would sometimes come after dinner was over and he himself would go to the kitchen and start cooking. The monks, of course, did not want him to do that. But he would say, you have worked so hard, let me cook. Sometimes people would come late at night and if they wanted to eat, the monks would get up and prepare a meal. If there were no extra beds, they would give their own beds to these visitors. A monk recalled, I didn't have any time to sleep in those days. I would just lie down on a bench for two to three hours. If there was any grumbling among the young monks, Premananda would say, Look, people suffer so much in the world. They come to Sri Ramakrishna's place to get some peace. It is your duty to make them feel welcome. It will be of great benefit to you, it will be of great benefit to them. Forty to some devotees once came with a baby who was crying for food. Premananda immediately set aside some milk for the master's offering and gave the rest to the baby. A rich family from Calcutta came to Belur Math by car and was about to leave without having prasad. Premananda asked a monk to run and give some prasad to them. The next day they sent a good quantity of sweets and other things for offering to the master. Premananda commented, Look, if the monks serve the devotees, the master makes them serve himself as well as the monks. But you serve them without any motive. Forty-three once a devotee from Madras fell asleep on the upstairs veranda. Premananda noticed this at midnight. He immediately set a mosquito curtain over his bed and began to fan him. The devotee woke up and was overwhelmed when he saw Premananda fanning him. On another occasion many devotees came to the monastery, seven, and they left their shoes in the courtyard and went to the shrine. In the meantime, it started raining. A Brahmacharin rushed to bring those shoes to the veranda and he began to lift them with his foot. Observing the Brahmacharin's feeling of superiority, Premananda said, Carry the devotee's shoes on your head. 44 In Varanasi he said to a monk, Look, a monk's bag should have two openings, which means things will come in from one side and will go out through the other. You serve a person who donates money and neglect another who cannot afford to. That is not proper conduct for a monk. 45 Swami Brahmananda was the president of the board of trustees and Premananda was a trustee. Once in the trustee meeting Swami Shuddhananda read the financial report and told Brahmananda that there was a 400 rupee deficit in connection with the service to the devotees. Brahmananda asked, Brother Baburam, how shall we tackle this deficit? Premananda replied, Maharaj, I have spent this money for serving the devotees, so I shall collect it by begging. 46. Another time Shuddhananda proposed to Brahmananda that there should be some rules and regulations about the devotees staying in Belur Math. Premananda said, Look, Shuddhananda, as long as we are alive, let it continue this way. When we die, you can open a hotel for the devotees. It is the master who brings the devotees and they bring everything for him. Likewise, it is the master who is eating and also who is feeding the devotees. What can we say about it? 47. During India's struggle for independence, some young men severed themselves from the freedom movement and joined the Ramakrishna order. Sometimes plainclothes police officers would come to Belur Math to keep track of these ex-revolutionaries. A police spy reminisced about Premananda's greatness under the instruction of higher authority, I went to Belur Math for an inspection. It was a hot summer noon. I walked all the way. When I arrived, I was exhausted and sat on a bench. It was quiet, it seemed all were resting. All of a sudden, a person came and began to fan me with a palm leaf fan. 
Afterwards, he gave me some prasad and a glass of cold water. I ate and felt greatly relieved. He knew who I was, still he served me, forty-eight love sees no faults. A young man from a noble family of Calcutta had fallen in with undesirable companions and through their influence had taken drugs. This was very painful for his relatives, who tried their best to correct his behavior, but all their efforts failed. In desperation, his brother, who was a monk, sought the help of Premananda. Premananda quietly listened to his story and then went to visit the boy. After a long talk, he convinced him to come to the monastery for a visit the following day, which he did. He continued to come to Belur many times afterwards. Gradually, the spiritual presence of Premananda began to change his character. How much tenderness and affection he bestowed on me, he recalled later. My relatives and friends abandoned me, but his love sustained me. He knew all my misdeeds, and still he loved me. Eventually he renounced the world and joined the order as a monk. 49 Training the young monks It is extremely difficult to train monks. They first observe the teacher's life, and then secondly his scholarship. Only a man of purity, renunciation, love and learning can train monks. Premananda was endowed with the first three qualities from his very birth. Although he did not have much formal education, day and night he read the living Upanishad, that is, the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Once a young man came to Premananda and expressed his desire to become a monk. The Swami told him, Now you are a student. Finish your bachelor's degree and then join the monastery. Swamiji had a BA degree. The young man said, Swami, is it not possible to become a monk without a BA degree? You have no BA degree. Premananda, addressing a monk, said, Look, what this boy says. My boy, whatever learning we needed, the master gave us. We don't need any degrees, 50 Premananda was an inspirer of souls. He reminded the monks, Never forget that the goal of human life is to realize God, to have His vision. That is why you have renounced hearth and home. Struggle hard to have love and devotion for Him. Yearn for Him with a longing heart. You are men. Be gods. Teach others by the example of your own life. After a few minutes of silence, he continued, I see very clearly that after we are gone, multitudes will come to learn from you young men. Who will listen to us? said a young monk. Premananda, don't think that you are inferior to us. You have received the grace of the Holy Mother. Do you think we have become great just because people take the dust of our feet? No. We first saw Sri Ramakrishna and then renounced the world. You are great indeed because you have renounced the world without seeing him. The young monk, the master made you great. Premananda, no. The master did not make us great, he made us nobodies. You also have to become nobodies. Wipe out all vanity from the mind. The master used to say, when the ego dies, all troubles cease. Not I, not I, but Thou, O Lord, 51 Premananda was an embodiment of humility, patience, forbearance and forgiveness. One day he revealed his mind to a senior monk, after finishing my morning meditation and japam when I come down the stairs of the shrine, I repeat again and again this mantram of the Master, Sha, Sha, Sa, Forbear, Forbear, Forbear. He who forbears, survives, and he who does not, perishes, fifty to devoid of any trace of pride and egotism, he felt himself to be an instrument in the hands of the Master. In Belur Math, Premananda had to act as a loving mother as well as a chastising father. He scolded the monks to correct their shortcomings, but his tender heart cried afterwards. Sometimes while walking alone in the courtyard of the monastery, 
He would admonish himself, O Baburam, be careful. O Baburam, be careful. Some of his letters indicate his inner feelings. I do not harbor the idea that I am good. I have come to learn. There is no end to learning. May the Master give us right understanding, this is my prayer. By observing the faults of others, we gradually become infected by them. We have not come to look at their faults and to correct them. It is only to learn that we are here. Lord, Thou art everything, whom should I scold? Everything is He, there is only a difference in the quantity of dust that covers the gold. 53 Despite His humility, Premananda could be stern if necessary. He laid great stress on gentleness of behavior. Be gentle first, he would often repeat, if you want to be a monk. He said regretfully, nowadays no one pays any attention to social and common good manners and gentle behavior. The master used to take extreme care to teach us these things. A monk wrote, by his eloquent and impassioned appeals, he would firmly impress upon the novitiates the high ideals of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Premananda times 203 Swami Vivekananda. As he held out vividly before their imagination the wonderful renunciation of the Master, his keen thirst for God-realization, his unheard-of devotion to truth, his strenuous religious practices and austerities, his wonderful realizations, and his profound love and kindness for his disciples, he would appear to be lifted out of the mundane plane and his words would electrify the audience. Thus he molded the young minds in the cast of a new ideal. 54 Premananda did not care for one-sidedness. He encouraged the monks to practice all four yogas, karma, janana, bhakti, and raja according to the ideals of Vivekananda. You should learn, he said, how to work in every walk of life, be it a worshipper in the shrine, a cook in the kitchen, a cowherd in the cowshed, or a sweeper in the toilet, be they great or small, all works should receive your equal attention. Always take as much care of the means as of the ends, 55 He could not bear the monks to be even slightly indifferent or careless towards their work. He scolded them vehemently, Yet he was quick to forgive and forget the faults of all. Premananda's scoldings are now legendary in the Ramakrishna order. Swami Gyaneswarnanda recalled, Because Swami Premananda was so loving to all, he was often referred to as the mother of the man. He could also be quite stern at times, but it was always for our good. I was once severely reprimanded by him. There had been talk about the Bhagavad Gita, and I had said, Yes, I have read it. Immediately Swami Premananda said, My boy, say I am reading it. Never say I have read the Gita. One can never finish reading the Gita. Another time we were weeding the math garden. Swami Premananda was watching us, and he noticed that one of the boys was not pulling the weeds out by the roots. He called out to him, My boy, you must pull the weeds out by the roots, otherwise, you are simply fooling yourself and wasting time. If you do not realize the necessity of rooting out weeds in the garden, how can you weed out your old faults and tendencies? How can you understand the real meaning of spiritual life? And he added, significantly, weed them out, boys. Weed them out, roots and all. On another occasion, Swami Premananda chastised us for talking too much, you talkative fools. You talk nothing but nonsense. Let not your tongue talk, let your character speak. And again, why do you buzz so much? You bees evidently haven't yet found the honey. 56. One day Premananda asked a Brahmacharin to cut fodder for the cows and sent him to the cowshed. The Brahmacharin began his duty with air confidence and shortly cut his finger. Premananda stopped by the cow, snaid on his usual rounds to see how different work was going on. 
The boy made to conceal his bleeding finger, but could not evade Premananda's vigilant eyes. He said sharply, You are careless. I asked you to cut the fodder, not your finger. Didn't I? You can see your finger bleed, but do you know how it makes another's heart bleed? I thought you were a very clever boy, but you have proved yourself a fool and me a greater one. Shame on you! You considered the work very trivial. 57 Then he took the boy to the dispensary and had his finger bandaged. Knowing that Premananda was a strict disciplinarian, Brahmananda sometimes would tease his brother disciple. One morning the monks were in Brahmananda's room upstairs and were engaged in spiritual talk. It began to grow late. Premananda found that the boys had not come downstairs to start their respective duties. So he shouted from downstairs, Hello, up there. You boys come down now. The master's lunch has not yet been arranged. Out of fun Brahmananda asked the boys to go to Premananda and to say, Sir, please give us liberation. Then we will have no more difficulty with our meditation, prayer and other disciplines. Surely you can do this for us. Overhearing Brahmananda's joke, Premananda shouted, All right, you practice your samadhi. To that I have no objection. I will handle everything by myself. But just once let me find the noise of the marketplace arising in your minds and I will pull you by the ears and soon put you back to work. 58 A monk was in charge of the kitchen store. One day while pouring oil, a few drops fell on the floor. Premananda saw it. He called to the monk, Why are you wasting the master's oil? The devotees donate their hard-earned money for the master's service. You will not have to work here anymore. I bow down to you. Premananda bent his head and left the place. The monk felt terrible. He continued his work, but did not eat any food for a few days except for drinking Ganges water. When Premananda heard about it, he embraced the monk and said, Are you mad at me? Who else do I have other than you? If you do not do right, shall I not scold you? No, for certain, a monk's scolding purifies the mind. 59 Premananda then gave him prasad and removed his mental agony. Once he approached a Brahmacharin who had been spending much of his time working in the garden, are you studying the scriptures or doing only the work of a coolie? The Brahmacharin sheepishly replied, One of our brothers reads and we listen. Moreover, I don't know Sanskrit well. Swami Dhirananda jokingly remarked, Out of fear of study he left home and now here you are asking him to study. Ignoring the joke, Premananda named a new English book and then sternly said to the Brahmacharin, Read that book from beginning to end within three months. Otherwise, you take just enough fare from the office for a ferry across the Ganges, which meant he would have to leave the monastery. 60 During those days scripture classes were held every evening in the visitor's room of the monastery. One evening after meditation, Premananda came there and found no one. The room was dark. He was greatly annoyed at this. When the news spread that Premananda was waiting in the classroom, other monks came. All were silent when Premananda asked why the class was not being held. At last a Brahmacharin said, We find it difficult to hold the class in this room. The devotees who come to the math are often found lying down or sleeping here. The compassionate Swami replied, Do you know how many worries and troubles they have in their lives? They are tormented in the world, so they come here for peace and rest. This place vibrates with a holy atmosphere and the gentle breeze of the Ganges. Where will you find such a peaceful place? Let them sleep. What are you here for? You have renounced everything to awaken people. The Master and Swamiji came to awaken the whole world. You have come to work for them. 
Can you not awaken these few people? Seeing you awakened, their sleep will break. 61 When Brahmananda, Turiyananda, or any other direct disciples of the Master were at Belur Math, Premananda would ask the young monks to serve them and associate with them. He told the monks, having the company of God, they have become gods. They are not ordinary people. Your life will be blessed if you associate with them and serve them. If Brahmananda was displeased with any monk, Premananda would take that monk to him and humbly plead, Maharaj, this boy is good. Please don't be mad at him. If you bless him by placing your palm on his head, all of his shortcomings will go away. Saying this, Premananda grasped Maharaj's hand and touched the head of the monk. 62 Once, after the evening service, Premananda sat for meditation in a corner of the southern veranda of the old shrine. The usual time passed, but he did not get up. When he came to offer the food, the attendant of the shrine found Premananda sitting motionless. He presumed that sleep had overtaken the Swami's tired body, and he called him repeatedly, but in vain. He returned after the shrine service and called him again, still there was no response. He then held a light before him. Slowly Premananda opened his eyes. When he was asked if he had fallen asleep, Premananda answered through a mystical song, I am awakened and will sleep no more. I am awake in the state of yoga. O Mother, I have given back thy mystic sleep to thee and have put sleep to sleep. Turning to the attendant he said, When you find me in that state, don't call me or cry aloud, but repeat the Master's name in my ears. That will bring me back, 63 on pilgrimage, and with brother disciples Premananda did not travel as much as some of his brother disciples did. In the early part of his monastic life, he accompanied his mother to Rameswaram, an important holy place in South India. Later, in 1906 he went to Puri, the holy place of Jagannath. One day he happened to notice a Christian missionary standing before the Jagannath temple, strongly upbraiding Hinduism. He could not bear to hear Hinduism denounced in that sacred place. He loudly began to chant the name of the Lord, Hari Bol. Hari Bol, the crowd quickly picked it up, and the missionary's voice was drowned out. The priests immediately expressed their gratitude to Premananda and said, We had been fearful of taking any action to stop the missionary. Premananda quickly left the place, abashed and sad at heart over his impulsive action. That night Sri Ramakrishna appeared to him in a dream and asked him, Why did you break up that gathering? That man was also spreading my name and teachings. Tomorrow you must find the missionary and apologize. The next morning, after a considerable search, Premananda located the house of the missionary and humbly asked his forgiveness. 64 In 1910, Premananda went with Shivananda and Turiyananda to see Amarnath, the ice lingam of Shiva in Kashmir. Later, Premananda wrote to Sister Devmata, Just imagine what a glorious experience it was for all of us. Both the vision of that great white cave of Amarnath at an altitude of about 18,000 feet and the toilsome journey through the most enchanting and soul-stirring scenery in the world. 65 They also visited Kshirbhavni and they stayed in a houseboat for a month in Srinagar. After visiting Kankhal, Hardwar and Varanasi, Premananda returned to Belur Math in December 1910. In 1914, Premananda went to Varanasi to bring Brahmananda back to Belur Math. Brahmananda was reluctant to leave the city of Lord Shiva. But, Maharaj, said Premananda, Swamiji is our Lord Shiva and he resides in Belur. Brahmananda remained silent. Then Brahmananda went to visit Prayag, Allahabad and Premananda followed him. One afternoon Premananda suddenly prostrated himself flat before his brother-disciple. 
Brahmananda immediately became excited and said, Brother, what are you doing? Get up! Get up! But Premananda remained firm. I will not. Not until you agree to return to Belur Math. Premananda's love and humility won. Brahmananda smiled, Rise, brother, rise. I will come back. 66 A remarkable incident took place during this trip that was later narrated by Swami Prabhvananda. It was in Varanasi in October 1914. Swami Premananda used to visit the temples of Lord Vishwanath and Mother Annapurna after taking his bath in the Ganges. I would accompany him. One day after we finished worship in the temple of Annapurna, the head priest placed a garland of marigolds around Swami Premananda's neck. When the Swami was about to take the garland off to give it to me, I saluted him, No, Maharaj, keep it yourself. You look so beautiful. The word beautiful reminded the Swami of God's beauty, and he went into ecstasy. His face flushed, and then a light began to emanate from his whole body. Walking slowly, he left the temple, and I followed him. The temple lane was crowded as usual, but on either side of us people stared at the Swami and made way. It was quite evident that everyone present saw him illumined. He was completely absorbed in the thought of God and oblivious of his surroundings. As we approached the outer gate of the monastery, Swami Nirbharananda, the abbot, saw us from the veranda. He immediately ordered the monks to prepare a special welcome for Swami Premananda. We entered the monastery grounds to the sound of bells and conch shells. As the Swami got to the veranda, he took off the garland and placed it around the neck of the abbot. For a brief moment he danced in ecstatic joy. Gradually the ecstasy abated and the divine light disappeared. 67 Although Premananda was essentially gentle-natured, he was neither emotional nor sentimental. But sometimes he would become God-intoxicated, and his blissful mood would unfailingly draw others into an elevated state. Once during Durga Puja in Belur Math, the monks were singing devotional songs. Premananda suddenly became filled with divine joy and urged Sardananda, Brother, you will have to sing a song. Don't you see how much joy is flowing here? But unless you sing, this flow of joy will not be complete. Sardananda protested that he had not sung for a long time. However, unable to avoid the loving request of Premananda, Sardananda sang and later joined in dancing with other brother disciples. He was quite bulky. The next day he remarked, Alas, Brother Baburam made me dance in my old age. 68 The disciples of Sri Ramakrishna had great love and respect for each other. Premananda and Shivananda were together once in Belur Math during the Shivratri festival. Addressing Shivananda, Premananda said, this is our Lord Shiva. Brother Tarak is our Shiva. Another day Brahmananda told the monks about Premananda, Listen, if you can follow sincerely one or two things that Premananda says, your lives will be blessed. Is he an ordinary man? He is so pure that in whatever direction he looks, everything in that direction becomes pure. 69 Once during the Master's birth anniversary, M. came to Belur Math to pay his homage to the Master. He was not well. After saluting the Master in the shrine, M. sat under the mango tree in the courtyard. He carried some puffed rice for refreshment and inquired if there was any curd, yogurt, in the storeroom. A young monk went to check and found a pot of curd that had not yet been offered to the Master. For that reason, it could not be given to M. While the monk was returning from the storeroom, Premananda learned from him that M needed curd. Premananda immediately took the pot and, standing in front of the master's picture, offered it to him with closed eyes. He then gave it to the monk to serve M. Afterwards, Premananda told the monk, with emotion, 
Today the master saved me from a grave error. Do you know him was an intimate companion of the master? The master eats food through the mouths of these devotees. Have you not read in the gospel, where the master says that if you feed one of them, you will attain virtue equivalent to feeding one thousand monks? In the Ramakrishna incarnation, M is the sage Vyasa, the recorder, and again the sage Narda, the singer. Day and night the gospel of the Master comes from his lips like a fountain. The Master saved me today from a serious mistake. Zero ego separates human beings from God, that is why Sri Ramakrishna always taught his disciples to be humble. Even after his passing away, the Master kept watch on his Baburam. Premananda was a strict vegetarian and had a little hidden repugnance for people who ate fish, this attitude occasionally would surface in his words and dealings. One night the master told him in a vision, Look, Baburam, my children eat a little fish. W. Tai, do you make so much fuss about it? Do you think that you have achieved everything because you don't eat fish? The next morning Premananda got up and first went to the kitchen and touched his tongue to the fish-cutting knife. He said to himself, I am Baburam, why should I hurt others' feelings? Afterwards he sent someone to the market to buy good fish. He then cut them, cooked them and served them to the monks himself. After lunch he apologized to the monks. The master used to say, The poison of the big cobra and the little cobra is the same. The same divinity abides in an illumined soul as well as in a young monk dot. I beg forgiveness from all of you. I must not say anything that could hurt others' feelings. 71 Premananda's whole life was one of complete self-surrender. Behind every action was the subtle but commanding presence of Sri Ramakrishna. Sometimes this presence became visible and Premananda would be blessed with a vision of his beloved Guru. However, this did not always occur under the most pleasant of circumstances. Once Premananda gave a pumpkin from the monastery garden to a poor Brahman. Seeing the Brahman taking away the pumpkin, Brahmananda said to Premananda, If you freely distribute the vegetables in this way, how shall we manage the master's service here? Premananda was hurt. He put his towel on his shoulder and marched out of the Belur compound, prepared to leave for good. But the moment he reached the gate, his towel was suddenly snatched from him and in an instant tightened around his neck. He turned, only to find the figure of Sri Ramakrishna standing in front of him. Where are you going, my child? the master said. How can you go away, leaving me here? Overwhelmed by the experience, Premananda rushed to Brahmananda and prostrated himself at his feet. 72 Premananda was one of the few disciples of the Master who had free access to Holy Mother. She was very fond of him, and Premananda was also very devoted to her. Whenever any monk would go to visit Mother at Udbodhan, Premananda would send flowers, vegetables, and milk for her asking the monk to convey his salutations to her. Because he never initiated anyone, he would send the devotees to Holy Mother or Brahmananda for initiation. Premananda's face actually glowed when he spoke about Holy Mother. He once said that those who differentiated between her and the Master would never make any spiritual progress, she and the Master were like the two sides of one and the same coin. In the course of a talk at Belur Math, he said to the devotees, We have seen that she had a much greater capacity than the Master. She was the embodiment of power and how well she controlled it. Sri Ramakrishna could not do so, though he tried. His power became manifest through his frequent ecstasies, which were seen by all. The mother repeatedly experienced Samadhi, but others did not know of it. What wonderful self-control she exercised. She Kov 14 arrayed herself with a veil, like a young bride in her husband's home. The people of Javrambati thought she was busy day 
and night looking after her nephews and nieces as a preacher. Light inspires light. Sometimes a great scholar with wonderful oratory cannot impress the audience. On the other hand, Ajge Sunjvit underscore underscore few words, not well arranged and perhaps jingrammatical, can make an immense impression. Vivekananda commented, words, even thoughts, contribute only one third of the influence in making an impression, the man two thirds. What you call the personal magnetism of the man, that is what goes out and impresses you. For Premananda was a magnetic and powerful speaker, and he talked based on his experience. He spoke from his heart, and the voice of the heart is understood by all. He pointed out again and again that religion lies in practice and not in the ORX purity and dispassion are two indispensable conditions for god -reication. During his stab at Dakshineswar, Premananda started to record some odd Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. But the Master told him, that is not war task many beautiful words of wisdom will burst forth from war lips. 75 If Holy Mother was in Calcutta, Premananda would always ask her permission to go anywhere to lecture. In 1914 Premananda was invited to speak down the Ramakrishna festival at Malda, North Bengal. He came with the devotees to Udbodhan to receive the mother's permission, but she refused it because Premananda had been sick only a fortnight higher. When the devotees again importuned Holy Mother about the trip, she asked Premananda if he wanted to go. He replied with great emotion, What do I know? Mother, I shall earn out your order. If you ask me to jump into fire, I will jump. If you ask me to plunge into water, I will plunge. If you ask me to enter into hell, I will enter. What do I know? Your word, J.S. Final, at last Halve Mother gave him permission, but she asked Ten to return soon. To die devotees, she said, you see, they are all great souls. Their bodies are channels for doing good to the world. Look after Black Diamond, rear physical comfort and ease. In Malda, Swami Premananda gave a lecture entitled Serve Human Beings as God. He emphasized Vivekananda's Karma Yoga, practical Vedanta, and concluded that the religion of this age is to serve mankind. When he was lecturing, a gentleman asked him to speak about love and devotion, but Premananda ignored him. But when the man repeated himself, Premananda said, Who will listen to love and devotion? I don't find anybody here who is fit to listen to it. Then the Swami continued, Sir, listen to a story. Once a street hawker was calling out, Who wants to buy la? Who wants to buy la? People opened their front doors and inquired about the price. The hawker said, Price. It is priceless. But I can sell this invaluable love in exchange for a head. Are you ready to give up your heads? People immediately shut their doors. Then pointing to the audience, Premananda said, Is there anybody here ready to give up his head, the ego? Everyone kept quiet. 77 in 1901, after returning from East Bengal, now Bangladesh, Vivekananda had said to Premananda, I have left East Bengal for you. It was a prophetic statement. Every year from 1913 to 1917, Premananda visited East Bengal, sometimes alone and once with Brahmananda. Swami Ashokananda recorded, his visits were all epic events. Wherever he went, thousands of people, old and young, Hindus and Muslims were attracted to him. And when he would leave a place, even after a visit of only a few days, people would run after him, crying. He probably would be going off in a horse carriage, and they would run to keep up with him. For miles people would follow him like that, shedding tears as if someone very near to them were dying. These are the real miracles of the Spirit.
he would just pull their hearts out, he bought them up, as it were, with his love, Hindus and Muslims alike, 78 as a result of Premananda's extensive preaching in East Bengal, many young men joined the Ramakrishna order. Premananda was an illumined soul, and he was beyond caste, creed, and religious sect. Knowing his universal attitude, the Muslim Nawab Salimullah of Dhaka invited Premananda to his palace. Premananda carried the master's prasad to the Muslim devotees. He met the Begans, Muslim women of royal families, in the palace of Nawab Ghani, told them the life story of Sri Ramakrishna and shared his message of the harmony of religions. Salimullah had read Swami Vivekananda's works and was attracted to the activities of the Ramakrishna mission. He invited Premananda to consult with him about opening a center in Dhaka for Muslim youths. Salimullah's sister, Begum Akhtarabanu donated some money for the construction of the Ramakrishna Math in Dhaka in her father's memory. Later some Muslim women became very seven drawn to Premananda and visited Belur Math. Knowing Premananda's successful mission in Dhaka, Turiyananda wrote to him, You are the precious jewel casket of Sri Ramakrishna. As an embodiment of love, you are distributing love like the gopis of Vrindavan. Brother, Save some love for us, 79 Observing Premananda's great enthusiasm for preaching, Brahmananda cautioned him not to overdo it, as his body was very fragile. To this Premananda said, I am perfect, eternally free. I am a follower of Swamiji, and it is he who asked me to carry the message of Sri Ramakrishna to every village, 80 On another occasion, Premananda asked Holy Mother, Mother, I don't have any learning, but people from various places invite me to speak. What shall I do? Mother replied, My son, don't worry. The master will speak sitting on your tongue. He is with you. 81 On one occasion Premananda was ready to go to East Bengal and the devotees were waiting for him in the boat at Belurghat. They were supposed to take the train from Calcutta and then take a steamer. Premananda went to the shrine to get the master's permission. A monk who happened to be there heard Premananda talking to the master, but he didn't hear the master's response. At last Premananda said, All right, master, I shall not go. He then came downstairs and told the devotees that he would not go that day. The devotees were disappointed, but the newspaper later reported that the steamer he was supposed to take from Golanda to Dhaka had been sunk by a cyclone. 82 In 1915, Premananda visited Rarikhal in Dhaka and stayed at the house of the famous scientist Jagdish Chandra Bose. The caretaker of the house gave him a nice room, but the bed was infested with bedbugs. As soon as he went to bed, he was attacked by them. He asked his attendant to light the lantern. The bedbugs temporarily disappeared when they saw the light, but they returned when it was turned off. Premananda sat on his bed and passed the whole night in meditation. The next day he continued his busy schedule, lecturing and talking to the people, and so on. When he was reminded to take rest, he said, my body does not get tired talking about the Master. 83 The devotees of Rarikhal invited Premananda to their Ramakrishna festival. They collected donations from Hindu villagers, but not from the Muslims, believing that they would not help a Hindu cause. But the Muslims had seen Premananda, some of them had talked with him, and the Muslim community was aware of his holiness. Does he belong to the Hindus only, they said. He is also our peer, Muslim saint. Dot. A Muslim delegation came to Premananda and said, What have we done that we were not asked for contributions for this festival? Why have we been left out? 84 They felt agreed. So Premananda sent volunteers to the Muslim community to collect funds, which they gladly gave for the master's festival. He said in a public meeting, 
we Hindus and Muslims are like two brothers. If we sincerely worship our respective gods without keeping any hatred for each other, our divine sight will open. Only then shall we realize all are one. 85. It is amazing how Premananda's unselfish love and feeling brought harmony between the Hindus and Muslims. After returning to Belur Math, Premananda was stricken by cholera. Two reputable doctors treated him. One day he lost outer consciousness and the monks almost lost hope. Gradually he opened his eyes and said feebly, Don't fear. I shall not die because my mother is still alive. Sri Ramakrishna had given his mother the boon that her children would not die before she did. Premananda recovered from his illness and left for Puri, where he stayed for three months. In September 1915, he returned to Belur Math. In January 1916, Premananda again left for East Bengal with Brahmananda and a group of monks. They visited Kamakya, a famous place for mother worship, Maimansingh, and Dhaka. On this occasion, Brahmananda laid the foundation stone of Ramakrishna mission in Dhaka. While there, the Swamis stayed at Agnes Villa and met some revolutionaries who were fighting for India's freedom. Swami Nikhilananda was then a college student and connected with a revolutionary society. He wrote in his memoirs, One morning I went to the villa with two members of our revolutionary society. Swami Premananda took us to a small room in which there were two beds. Swami Brahmananda was seated on one of them. Swami Premananda took his seat on the other. After saluting Swami Brahmananda, we sat on the floor. Swami Premananda introduced us to Swami Brahmananda and said to him, Maharaj, look at these young men. They are all fine boys, but completely misguided. They have become revolutionaries in order to serve India. Please give them right advice. Usually very reserved, Swami Brahmananda asked us in an earnest voice to give up the method of violence and follow in the footsteps of Swami Vivekananda. He said that we must first build our character and only then take up the service of the country. By way of illustration, he said, if gunpowder is damp, it will not explode. However, you may try to ignite it, you will only be wasting matchsticks. But if the powder is dry, one match will be enough to produce the explosion. He emphasized that Swami Vivekananda was a real patriot and that we should follow his instructions. But, sir, I said, you have not understood Swami Vivekananda, the lap of Mother Earth, and I enjoyed every bit of it. I cannot describe to you that night's glories, after the year of brutal life that I have led, to sleep on the ground, to meditate under the tree in the forest. The inn people are more or less well-to-do, and the camp people are healthy, young, sincere, and holy men and women. I teach them all Shivoham, Shivoham, I am Shiva, I am Shiva, and they all repeat it, innocent and pure as they are, and brave beyond all bounds, and I am so happy and glorified. In the same letter, Swamiji inspired his American sisters, who sincerely helped his Western work. Wealth goes, beauty vanishes, life flies, powers fly, but the Lord abideth forever, love abideth forever. Stick to God, who cares what comes, in the body or anywhere, through the terrors of evil, say, My God, my love. Through the pangs of death, say, My God, my love. Do not go for glass beads, leaving the mine of diamonds. This life is a great chance. What? Seekest thou the pleasures of this world? He is the fountain of all bliss. Seek the highest, aim for the highest, and you shall reach the highest. 46. While in New York in the early part of 1895, Swamiji met Miss Josephine MacLeod and her sister Betty, who later married Francis Leggett. They not only worked for Vedanta, but also took care of Swamiji's personal needs. 
In the middle of 1895, when Swamiji was exhausted from lecturing in New York, Mr. Leggett invited him to his retreat cottage at Camp Percy, New Hampshire. On 7th June 1895, Vivekananda wrote to a friend about his visit to the camp, It gives me a new lease on life to be here. I go into the forest alone and read my Gita and am quite happy. After a short visit to Camp Percy, Swamiji went to Thousand Island Park on the St. Lawrence River in New York State. Miss Elizabeth Dacha, a Vedanta student, gave her cottage to Swamiji so that he could rest there as well as give classes for sincere students. Swamiji stayed there nearly seven weeks and taught his American students the uplifting philosophy of Vedanta along with the lives and teachings of other great teachers of the world. These teachings were later published as inspired talks. In Thousand Island Park, Swamiji initiated some of his male and female students into sannyasa and brahmacharya, reminding them again and again, find God. Nothing else matters. He emphasized morality as the basis of spiritual life. Without truth, non-violence, continence, non-covetousness, cleanliness and austerity, he repeated, there could be no spirituality. On the morning of 7th August 1895, he went for a walk with Sister Christine and Mrs. Mary Funt. They strolled about half a mile up a hill covered with trees and sat under a low-branched tree. Vivekananda suddenly said to them, Now we will meditate. We shall be like Buddha under the bow tree. Vivekananda became so still that he seemed to turn to bronze. Then a thunderstorm came and it poured rain. The Swami was absorbed in meditation, oblivious to everything around him. Mrs. Funk raised her umbrella and protected him as much as possible. After a while Vivekananda regained his outer consciousness and looking around said, Once more am I in Calcutta in the rains. That evening he left for New York. In mid-August, Swamiji left for Paris, where Mr. Francis Leggett had invited him to be his guest. Before he left, however, both Miss Henrietta Muller and E.T. Sturdy invited him to London to teach Vedanta. Swamiji was also eager to do some constructive Vedanta work in England and decided to establish a society there. For that purpose, he brought from India Swami Sardananda and later Swami Abhedananda. During his first visit to the West, Vivekananda travelled to England three times from September to November 1895, from April to July 1896 and from October to December 1896. Miss Margaret Noble, later, Sister Nivedita, wrote in her book The Master As I Saw Him. It is strange to remember, and yet it was surely my good fortune, that though I heard the teachings of my master, the Swami Vivekananda, on both the occasion of his visits to England in 1895 and 1896, one yet knew little or nothing of him in private life, until I came to India in the early days of 1898. What the world wants today, is twenty men and women who can dare to stand in the street yonder and say that they possess nothing but God. Who will go? He, Swami Vivekananda, had risen to his feet by this time and stood looking round his audience as if begging some of them to join him. Why should one fear? And then, in tones of which, even now, I can hear again the thunderous conviction, if this is true, what else could matter? If it is not true, what do our lives matter? 47 During his second visit, the Swami electrified English audiences with his Janana Yoga lectures. In addition, he gave a series of lectures at the Royal Society of Painters in Watercolours in Piccadilly, in clubs, educational societies and in private circles. The British press expressed great admiration for him. Vivekananda wrote to a disciple in Madras, In England my work is really splendid. Vivekananda attracted some sincere British followers 
who dedicated their lives for his mission. Two of them were J. J. Goodwin, who became his stenographer and recorded many four we read in his books that he wants us to shed our blood for India's freedom. That is what the revolutionaries are doing. You have not understood Swami Vivekananda's teachings. That was too much for Swami Premananda. You idiot, he exclaimed. You do not know with whom you are talking. We knew Swamiji for over twenty years. We ate together, played together, talked together, and discussed our plans of work together, and we have not understood him. And you fools have read a few pages of his books and understand him completely. Then, addressing Swami Brahmananda, he said, Maharaj, did you hear that? He said that you did not understand Swamiji. Do you think he has the intelligence of a horse? Let me see if he can carry me on his back. Suddenly he left his bed and asked me to go down on all fours. Sitting on my back, with his feet hanging down on both sides, he asked me to take him round the room as if I were a real horse. I did as I was asked. After a minute or two he dismounted and said to me that everything would be all right. Swami Brahmananda looked at the whole affair benignly and again advised us first to mould our character. We left the room and that was the end of my connection with the Revolutionary Society. 86 One day Premananda and Brahmananda went to visit Devgok, the home of Nag Mahashay, Saint Durgacharan Nag, who was an ideal householder disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. Premananda bowed down in front of his cottage and lamented, Oh, if Nag Mahashay were alive today! Brahmananda also said, What a holy place! Nag Mahashay was a great soul, so this place is vibrating with consciousness. Then the Swamis and devotees sang and danced in ecstasy in the courtyard. They chanted, Hari Harai Nama, Krishna Yadvaya Nama, Yadvaya Nama, Krishna Madhvai Nama. Salutation to Hari, Salutation to Krishna, Salutation to Yadava and Madhva. Dot 87 Premananda returned to Belur Math on 26th February 1916. On 5th March he told the monks, During my last visit to Dhaka, I used to talk day and night with the devotees. This would often cause insomnia. Of course I would repeat and explain only the words of the Master, myself I know nothing, yet I could not sleep at night. That was because I am but a small vessel. But we have seen the Master going again and again into ecstasy and samadhi, it was so natural with him, 88 on another occasion he said, Who will preach? Nobody is needed to preach Sri Ramakrishna. He is preached by himself. Wherever I go, I see the glory of the Master. Out of mercy he took me to all those places to see how he was spreading his ideas among the people. 89. On Sunday, 5th March 1916, the annual general meeting of the Ramakrishna mission was held at Belur Mat. When the agenda of the meeting was completed, Brahmananda asked Premananda to give a talk. Premananda spoke to the audience. Elephants have two sets of teeth, one outside, the tusks, and another inside to chew food. The activities of our mission are like the elephant's tusks. Whatever work you may do, managing hospitals or conducting relief work, unless you have character, all will be in vain. What is wanted is character, purity, steadfast devotion to God. If you have them, you will prosper, otherwise you will totally fail. To the lay members, it is no good being only members of the mission. You must build up your own character, you must make the whole world your own through love, so that people may find inspiration from your selflessness, renunciation and purity. You must drive away all egotism and pride from your heart and consider yourselves as servants of the Lord and thus serve humanity. Our Master never sought name and fame 
and so they have come to him in profusion. Swamiji often said in his later life that he was disgusted with name and fame. Be you all men of character. Grow into gods. Only then will the work of the mission prosper. This is my earnest prayer to you all. 90. In 1917, Premananda made his last visit to East Bengal. In my mensing, a Muslim teacher heard Premananda say that all religions are true and the same God exists in all beings. To test Premananda, the Muslim teacher asked, Sir, you are preaching a wonderful Catholic attitude, but can you partake of food from my plate? An orthodox Hindu will never eat food touched by a Muslim dot. Yes, I can, replied Premananda. Immediately some food was brought on a plate, and without the slightest hesitation he partook of it from the hands of the Muslim teacher. One day at Dhaka, Premananda and other monks and devotees were invited to dinner at a devotee's home. Premananda was speaking to the group with his usual fervour. In the audience was the curator of a museum, who was a skeptic. In the course of the talk, Premananda said, Pray to God for spiritual treasures, such as devotion, knowledge, power of discrimination, dispassion, and so forth. The curator interrupted, Why should we pray to God? Does He not know what we need? Premananda answered, Yes, if you feel that way, if you are convinced that God knows all your needs and will fulfill them, then you don't have to pray. But many pray to God for the fulfillment of their worldly desires, for material things. Is it not wise to pray to Him for the Eternal instead of the Evanescent? Who but a fool will approach the King of Kings for a trifle? If you pray to God, pray to Him for the Highest, 91. A real teacher must be ready to sacrifice himself and to set an example for others. Premananda's favourite saying was, If you want to be a Sardar, leader, be Sirdar, ready to sacrifice one's head. One day Premananda was visiting Hasra, a village close to Dhaka. On the way he saw a pond full of water hyacinth, a terrible pest in East Bengal that pollutes water and fosters the breeding of mosquitoes, which carry malarial fever. Many people suffer and die from malarial epidemics. He asked the young men who accompanied him to clear the pond. To set an example, he himself got into the water to remove some of them. This seriously affected his health. Towards the end, Either because of physical exhaustion in Dhaka or from eating tainted food, Premananda contracted a high fever. He returned to Belur Math in the middle of June 1917. Doctors diagnosed it as Kalazar, a malignant fever that was then difficult to cure and frequently fatal. During the rainy season, the climate of Belur Math was not good. So he was taken to Udbo Ghan first and then to Balaram's house for treatment. Premananda followed his guru's teaching renounce lust and gold till death. Once in Calcutta he found a bag in a carriage. He asked the driver to take him to the place where he dropped his last passenger. When they arrived and the driver identified the person, Premananda introduced himself and handed over the bag to him. Immediately the gentleman checked the contents and found everything, including 5,000 rupees cash. Overwhelmed, the gentleman saluted Premananda and exclaimed, Such honesty is only possible for a disciple of Ramakrishna. 92 One day Harmohan Mitra's mother, a devotee of the Master, came to see Premananda. Because he was very weak, the Swami asked his attendant to cover his body with a chadar and sit him up by putting two pillows at his back. After a brief conversation, Harmohan's mother left. Curious, the attendant asked Premananda, This woman devotee is five years older than your mother. Why did you cover your body with a chadar and meet her in a formal way? Premananda replied, You see, the Master taught us not to talk with women in a casual way with a bare body. A monk should be very careful 
93 on 20th October 1917 Shantiram informed his brother Premananda that their mother had been attacked by plague and her condition was critical. Premananda asked his attendant Satyananda to check on his mother since he had worked for some time in the hospital. After checking her pulse and observing her condition, Satyananda told Shantiram that most probably his mother would pass away that very day. According to Hindu custom, it is very auspicious to die touching the Ganges. So Premananda's brothers, relatives and Satyananda took Matangini to the bank of the Ganges so she could touch the water. While lying on a cot she continued to repeat the mantram with her rosary. Shortly she said, Jai Rama Krishna, Jai Rama Krishna, Jai Rama Krishna, victory to Rama Krishna, and then passed away. 94 sometime in March or April 1918, Premananda was sent by his Calcutta doctors to Deoghar, a health resort in Bihar. In the beginning his health improved, but shortly his fever relapsed and dot he developed stomach. Trouble. The local doctors took special care of him. In spite of his illness, every day at 11 a.m., he would send his attendant to Deoghar station to receive visiting devotees and to arrange for their food and stay. Shivananda came to visit him and remarked, I see you have opened a hotel here also. Brother, replied Premananda, as long as I live my hotel will go with me. I see that the master brings food, he eats, he feeds. I see that the devotees, God, and the Bhagavata are the same. 95 One day Premananda expressed a desire to meet the famous Yogi Balananda Brahmachari of Deoghar. When this news reached Balananda, he came to visit the Swami. Observing Premananda's physical condition, Balananda said, Sir, if a monk does not have any attraction for his own body, it does not last. If you kindly bring a little attention to your body, it will be cured. Premananda replied, You see, I don't have any attachment to this body. Now I look upon it like a rotten pumpkin, so my mind does not go to it at all. While leaving Balananda said to the attendant, His body will not last long. 96 During this time there was a worldwide influenza epidemic and many people died. Premananda caught this deadly flu. When the sad news reached Belur Math, Shivananda went to Deoghar and brought Premananda back to Balaram's house. It was Saturday, 27th July 1918. Dr. Bipin Bihari Ghosh, Premananda's cousin, examined him and did not give any hope. His bed was made in the big upper hall. Brahmananda was staying in the next western room and Turiyananda was downstairs. Turiyananda had had surgery on his leg in Puri so he could not walk. Premananda wanted to see him, so two months carried him on a chair to Premananda's room. Turiya Handa sat on his bed, held his hand, and both looked at each other. What a scene! Tears began to trickle from their eyes and both remained silent. When Sardananda came from Udbodhan, Premananda said to him, You know, I have a great desire to put on a cloth of pure yellow and to eat rice white as jasmine. Sardananda understood. That is a symbolic description of Radha, the aspect of God of which Sri Ramakrishna had said he was a part. Sardananda knew then that Premananda would not live long. 97 The next day, Premananda asked his attendant to call Brahmachari Janana, a disciple of Swamiji, from Belur Math, who was then supervising the monastery. In a feeble voice, Premananda asked, Janana, could you do one thing for me? Anything, sir. Will you be able to serve the devotees? Yes, sir. I promise I shall do it. Remember, let there be no negligence towards the devotees. Premananda entreated. It was his last wish. 98 On Tuesday, Premananda's condition deteriorated. Brahmananda was gravely pacing on the veranda and engaged his attendant to chant hymns near Premananda. 
All of a sudden he carried a picture of Sri Ramakrishna to Premananda and said, Brother Baburam, please look at the master. Brahmananda tried to suppress his own tears by pressing a cloth on his mouth. He then left the room. After a while Brahmananda returned again and said loudly, Brother Baburam, Brother Baburam, do you remember the master? Premananda opened his eyes, looked with a smile at the oil painting of the master hanging on the wall and saluted him with folded hands. He uttered feebly, Grace, 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 and then passed away. It was 4.14 p.m. on Tuesday, 30th July 1918. His body was taken to Belur Math and cremated there on the bank of the Ganges. When the news of Premananda's death reached Holy Mother in Udbodhan, she cried bitterly. She told the devotees, Baburam was dearest to my heart. All the energy, devotion and wisdom of Belur Math were embodied in my Baburam and walked there on the bank of the Ganges. 99 Brahmananda cried like a child and then remarked, Belur Math has lost its mother, 100 M said, Shri Ramakrishna's love aspect has disappeared. 101 Premananda closed his market of love and flew away into the infinite onto powerful wings, renunciation and love. At the time of his passing, his possessions were an empty canvas bag, a couple of ochre cloths, a short tunic, a chadar, a towel, a pair of slippers, an umbrella, and a few books, including a copy of the Gita. Truly he was Premananda, bliss in love. He was bliss and he was love, an all-consuming love that revealed itself in the service of all, it was the burning passion of his life. Towards the end of his life he casually wrote to someone, I feel a desire now to love everybody. This is a disease which has now possessed me, 102.